looking at early 20th century Barbados, we're seeing that the, we see that the main, cri the main crisis, main public health crisis was really a very high infant mortality rate. Now, um, infant mortality, infant mortality rate, or IMR for a country is calculated by using the number of infant deaths before the age of one per thousand live births in a given year. The rate can be used as a general indicator of a community's prevailing health status and can be a measurement of a population's living conditions and general welfare. It is used nationally or internationally to recognize population, populations that are in need of aid and ameliorative assistance or to compare the socioeconomic development of societies. In the first three decades of the 20th century, Barbados was known to have one of the highest infant mortality rates in the British Empire. In 1923, the MR for Barbados was 317, but in Trinidad, it was only 129. In England and Wales, it was 69. One is prominent to ask why this was so. Comments from public health officials, doctors, and poor relief administrators during the period reviewed in this paper blamed the high MIR on economic factors such as poverty, malnutrition, low wages, and inadequate housing and sanitation. The poor law inspector's reports reveal that the number of infant deaths could be attributed more specifically to the diseases of typhoid fever, measles, diphtheria, whooping cough, and dysentery. In 1907, the colonial secretary sent a circular letter to the poor law guardians of St. Philip and probably all other parishes. It stated that the governor was concerned about the high infant mortality in Barbados. The letter noted that, in spite of its conspicuous advantage over other tropical areas in the matter of climate, statistics disclose the fact that the infant mortality is higher in this island than in any other West Indian island, or in Demerara or Honduras. His Excellency feels the urgent necessity of adopting preventative measures due to improper feeding. This, in its turn, may be attributed partly to poverty, but also to ignorance on the part of mothers. It was noted that hundreds of infants die every year in Barbados from improper and dirty food, which cause diarrhea and vomiting. Diarrhea in babies is chiefly due to improper foods, such as flour pap and molasses tea, to bad or sour milk, and often to dirty cups and spoons, dirty feeding bottles and nipples. So this was the, obs the observation of the colonial administrators at the time, that the problem was really due to poverty, which in turn lent, led to um, the bad feeding of infants or improper feeding. Mothers are compelled by economic conditions to return to their household duties from three to seven days after confinement. And if the infant survives the administration of various pushtis, its fate is doubly precarious. As soon as the mother resumes her normal calling, and it is left to the unskilled care of a guardian of child of tender years. The sanitation of the workers of the working men's house is primitive in the extreme and offers rich soil for various intestinal disorders. It is doubtful that the mothers whose children were most vulnerable to high morbidity and mortality um, were able to devote themselves to breastfeeding because breastfeeding would have mitigated against um, in, um, the effects of infected milk or dirty feeding utensils. Um, because many, many women of that era worked, they worked outside the home, many of them worked um, particularly in, in, um, in agriculture. They may have been able to buy fresh milk on a regular basis, and their living environment was probably not conducive to the maintenance of sterile feeding conditions. Also, the use of condensed milk in the absence of fresh milk was not sound, despite the fact that its usage was widespread. Um, this is the, there was not a lot of powdered milk available at that time, and therefore mothers resorted to the use of condensed milk. 
So um, we're left with the question, then, what was being done about this, this situation, this terrible um, mortality rate among children? The fact is, the matter is that very little was done. The administrators of the, at the time, the colonial administrators, could, did not really have the authority to, um, to affect the problem where it really existed, which was in the parishes of the island. Now, at that time, there were no public health mechanisms or institutions that had responsibility for the island's health as a whole. The, the parish vestries were responsible for the health of the parish, and the, um, the poor law guardians were responsible for the welfare of the poor in the parishes. Now, the vestries were very often controlled by um, rather conservative elements. Um, the, the planter merchant um, class, and um, these individuals were very often not inclined to want to spend the, the taxpayers' money on the welfare of the poor of the parish. There, were, um, poor, there was poor relief. Poor relief was given, but um, it was not of a nature that could have really made a difference to the, this particular problem. As a matter of fact, when, when people applied for poor relief, um, they, they were subjected to a great deal of scrutiny because the last thing the vestry officials wanted um, was for the undeserving poor to, to benefit from um, the, the, the welfare available within the parish. So we have a situation where then there is um, an unwillingness to exact any kind, to, to effect or create or formulate any programs, any Problem, any programs with any um, any lasting or a lasting capacity to, to make a difference. Various parishes at some times did make attempts in terms of providing condensed milk and maybe hiring um, district nurses and so on. But in the, the first two decades of the 20th century, these schemes were short-lived. And to illustrate the um, the problem that this created, um, I'm going to give you a quotation from on the slide here. And this is from the Public Health Commission report from 1925 to 26. This commission was a um, commission on public health. And there was a minority report in this commission. And it was submitted by um, J.W. Hawkins and A.J. Hanschel. And this was the opinion that they give, they give in the minority report. The universal law of, laws of nature, the survival of the fittest, will, in spite of good sanitation, send to the wall as many of the weakest as will nearly equal the number of births. The weakest are mostly the infantile and particularly the illegitimates. This law must act more rigidly in Barbados than in, other, in, in countries not so saturated and where there is room for increase. This, so this is a very Malthusian philosophy. In other words, the island is overpopulated and therefore this is the result, a high infant mortality rate. Um, this is a, 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 a natural thing that would occur because of overcrowding. So with this kind of, this kind of philosophy, um, among the vestrymen, we can see why they were very reluctant to really do anything to change the system. This opinion showed total indifference to the prevailing economic circumstances. Most of the population was employed in agricultural labor and domestic service. In 1930, 34,157 persons were employed in the former. When contemporary food prices are related to wages, one sees that it was virtually impossible for the laboring class to maintain a proper diet for themselves and their children. After the passage of the Registration of Deaths Act in 1925, a report was published annually giving statistics on the causes of death for various age groups. These detailed statistics make it possible to formulate some theories about infant mortality. 
In looking at the diseases responsible for the high infant mortality, one finds that diarrhea and enteritis were the leading causes of death for children and adults. This implicates poor environmental conditions, poor hygiene, and food contamination. Syphilis was the next highest cause. It took a tragically large toll on the infant population. It would have caused extreme suffering and reveals also the prevalence of venereal disease among the adult population. The congenital form of syphilis can, mislead to mis can lead to miscarriage and stillbirths. Babies who survive birth may appear quite healthy at first, but in a few weeks may start to show symptoms of wasting away where the skin appears loose and wrinkled. Eruptions then develop and breathing becomes snuffled due to inflammation of the mucous membrane of the mouth and nose. Deafness may also occur due to inflammation in the inner ear. However, in some cases, there may be no manifestation of symptoms until the child is in his teens. The next largest category was debility marasmus. This disease category referred to bodily weakness, lack of loss of, lack or loss of strength, and reflects the death of children that were suffering from undernourishment and lack of proper care. The diseases listed under diseases of early infancy included jaundice, injury at birth, and diseases of the umbilicus, sometimes referred to as neonatal tetanus. In, in analyzing these diseases, it's important to state that infant mortality is divided into different categories or stages. It is important to distinguish between the neonatal mortality, that is, those, in, those deaths occurring in the first month of life, and the post-neonatal mortality deaths, which occur between the end of the first month and the end of the first year, since they're caused by different factors. Neonatal mortality is usually caused by events during pregnancy or childbirth, such as prematurity, congenital malformations, and birth injury. Post-neonatal mortality is due to respiratory and gastrointestinal infections caused by adverse environmental conditions, such as poor sanitation, contaminated water supplies, overcrowding, and exposure to infection. This suggests the need to examine what proportion of infant mortality in Barbados was neonatal or post-neonatal. The diseases that contributed to the neonatal mortality given in statistics would be premature births and the various diseases of early infancy. Since premature births and early infantile diseases are generally caused by conditions during pregnancy and birth, one can theorize that prenatal conditions did not contribute greatly to overall infant mortality. The only exception to this was congenital syphilis, where the infants were infected by their mothers in utero. Postneonatal mortality is reflected through diarrheal and enteric diseases, infantile debility, marasmus, bronchitis, and pneumonia. Like most neonatal killers, these are linked to poor living standards and environmental conditions. The supply of clean running water, along with proper domestic hygiene, would, contribute to, would have contributed to a, a decrease in these diseases. Education on infant feeding and the delivery of a nutritious weaning diet would have mitigated against debility and marasmus, but the economic conditions prevented proper nourishment. There are much of the post-neonatal mortality was preventable. Had the authorities been willing to implement the necessary preventative measures? Other facts that point to poor living, to a poor living, poor living environment was that infant mortality fluctuated on a seasonal basis. The number of deaths was always highest in the third and fourth quarters of the year. Demographers have observed that it is subtropical, in, that in subtropical underdeveloped countries, that tend, it is in subtropical underdeveloped countries that tend to have their highest mortality in summer. The summer peak is due to diarrhea and enteritis. In Barbados, one can also conclude that these also cause the summer peak since they were always among the leading causes of death. But why they should have been devastated in the summer can only be guessed. 
These months are also the rainy season when there was greater opportunity for the contamination of water in the ponds and springs or the excessive breeding or in the excessive breeding of flies. The, um, at this particular point in time, most of the population did not have access to running water. Stampites were available, but you still found the tendency where people were, um, before the, the wide availability of stampipes, people took the water from springs and ponds, so hence the contamination, um, contaminated water. Also, this is a period which was known as the out-of-crop season, when the cane had already been harvested, and there was greater likelihood of unemployment and hardship. Whatever the cause, this was clearly a time of greater morbidity in which more infants were expected to die. Another environmental factor which is implicated in a cause for high MR was overcrowded. In examining um, the table on the screen, which provides birth and mortality rates for various countries in 1937, we see that the countries with, highest, with the highest infant mortality rates are Malta with 242, Hong Kong with 361, and Barbados with 217. These also have the highest population densities. There must therefore be a correlation between the two statistics. A high population density suggests crowded living conditions, inadequate sanitation, and that national resources may be inadequate, may, may be insufficient or in, inadequately inadequate to care for the health needs of the population. So, um, the table there gives you the statistics. So, if we look at the population density, it, it gives you a clue. And Barbados always certainly has been one of the uh, country with a high population density. Okay, now to focus on the health of mothers. In most countries during the 19th century, it was not customary for birth to take place in hospital. By the turn of the century, the almshouses that were built in the various parishes became a haven for poor women who had no other avenue of assistance when they went into labor. As a result of this, delivery in the almshouse was associated with destitution. The poor relief system established in the 1880s provided almshouse care for lying in cases and medical care by the doctor who was employed by the parish vestry to treat the sick poor. He was only to be sent for or seen in an emergency. Women who gave birth at home, but who could not afford to pay the widmife who attended them could apply to the poor relief inspector. If the case was deserving, the, best, the vestry would pay the midwife's fee. This system did not work well for medical emergencies. Women could develop life-threatening complications during or after delivery. Yet within the system, there was little sensitivity to urgency. The same procedures had to be followed regardless of the crisis. A friend or relative would go to the poor relief inspector for the parish and explain the nature of the case. The inspector would then have to visit to ascertain whether it was authentic and warranted a doctor's attention. Then he had to find the medical officer and direct him to visit the patient to perform the necessary medical services. This delay could cost the life of the mother and or child but for the poor, there was no other recourse since the cost of a doctor's visit was well out of their reach. A lying in ward at the Central Lamps House, which is now um, the St. Michael um, Geriatric Hospital, was provided in 1885. It was intended for actual vagrants to save them from being confined in the streets. However, it quickly became a haven for other destitute women. Purple eclampsia was the most common disease of pregnancy in Barbados until the late 1950s. Eclampsia is an acute disorder peculiar to pregnant women. It is marked by convulsions with a loss of consciousness, usually followed by a more or less prolonged coma. This illness is associated with hypertension, edema or swelling, and or protein in the urine. The other more common diseases of the purple state were purple septicemia, sometimes referred to as purple fever. I believe in the Barbadian vernacular, this was known as um, a lining cold. Lying in, lying in. 
In 1905, the poor law inspector had the following to say about this disease. The childbirth fever requires more than a passing remark. For the public health point of view, it is a disease which is preventable to a great extent, but yet annually claim a fair quota of victims. Much may yet be done to minimize the number of cases by the granting of certificates to women who have had a proper course of training at the St. Michael Am's House, which is the only institution where such knowledge may be practically obtained at present. Training of midwives was recommended here as a solution to the problem of puerperal septicemia. Certainly, training about antisepsis and basic practices such as the washing of hands would have contributed to the reduction of the disease. However, before the advent of sulfonamides, no significant reduction in this disease and its resultant mortality would be seen. Septicemia seems not to have been a problem at St. Michael Amsels. The inspector remarked that there was less incidence of it in Barbados than in colder climates. Despite the concern about septicemia, he was pleased with the treatment of purple eclampsia at the Amsels. The poor law inspector also felt that midwives would be trained, should be trained in resuscitation techniques Six many babies who were deemed to be born dead could have been revived with the correct procedure. This is, um, of course, the pitch, a picture of the um, St. Michael, what used to be the St. Michael Amsels, where the first maternity ward would have been established. The general hospital did not have a dedicated ward for maternity cases. It was seen that maternity patients requiring surgery were sent to the general hospital. Problematic deliveries at the Amsels were tackled by methods other than surgery. Instruments such as forceps were used, but there was no way of assessing the Amsels' success with, the, with problematic deliveries. There were many instances where medical officers were called to emergencies to find that the child had already died. In 1924, the poor law inspector expressed concern about the health of mothers. One fact that emerges prominently from the register of, maternity, of the maternity ward is that the health of expectant mothers of the class that uses the lying in ward is at an exceedingly low level. As 13.7% of their children are born dead, and 40.7% of these were prematurely born. These facts show the need for, of a special maternity welfare clinic at the Amsels at which expectant mothers are in ill health or in need, could attend weekly for medical advice and treatment and obtain assistance to procure sufficient food during the last two or three months of pregnancy. Many such mothers no doubt get insufficient food at this time for various reason, reasons which can be easily imagined. The provision of maternity and child welfare centers is one of the most important duties of a modern community and cannot be neglected without disastrous consequences to the health of mothers and infants. He acknowledges that the economic circumstances facing the working class contributed to the poor state of maternal and child health, a fact that, was, that very few public officials at the time were willing to admit. The suggestion of a prenatal clinic was progressive and insightful. The inspector saw an urgent need and felt that it was the responsibility of government to provide such facilities. Although all the parochial Amsels admitted maternity cases, the one in St. Michael was the only public institution which trained midwives until 1947 when a maternity hospital was opened, especially for this purpose. However, for most Barbadian women, it was not the Amsels or the parochial med medical officer to whom they turned at their time of confinement, but it was to the midwives. The 1932 Nurses and Midwives Registration Act was passed. It established a general nursing council for the island to oversee the nursing profession and proposed that the registrar of the island publish an annual list of all certified nurses and midwives and their names. Um, while I was conducting the research, um, this research on maternal and child health, I had the privilege of interviewing um, some old midwives, and I would divide them into three categories. 
there were midwives who were totally untrained, who were basically learnt um, the midwifery, their midwifery skills on the job. There were um, semi-trained midwives, midwives who were trained um, with the assistance of, under, or under the supervision of a medical doctor. And there were the prof more professional midwives who were trained at the um, St. Michael Infirmary, the, the AMSOS there. Um, there is so much of this. I, okay, let me see. A little on the midwives. The doctors of Barbados attested to the efficiency of the local midwives, most of whom in the 1930s and 40s had little training. Since these women were the chief providers of care for the masses of women during the first half of the 20th century, they, sorry, all right. All right, I will mention two midwives, Augusta Carrington, Rock Hall, St. Andrew. She was at age 102 at the time of the interview. She said, by my mother was a midwife. By the time she mined me with my first child, I mined mine with my second one. She received very little monetary reward for her deliveries. According to her, sometimes only a thank ye. She was interviewed in the presence of one of her former clients, Ms. Cumberbatch, who claimed that many times Augusta was paid with a strong drink. She delivered 11 children for Ms. Cumberbatch, who was a hawker. The technique employed by Augusta and the other older midwives when difficult delivery arose involved the use of heat on the abdomen. She would place water in the chamber pot and put her client to sit over this. Soak a towel, piece of cloth or floor bag in a basin and place it on the abdomen. She recounted one incident when she used this procedure. Sometimes the children lazy and when they lazy, the hot water would speed them up. I mind a lady with one of our bishops. The child come, he was foot first. And I say, wait, he, like, he mean to kill his mother. I say so. I say, Lord, I call for my hot water. Put some in the tensile and sit. She down over that, over the hot water. Then he turn right away around and come out head first. <laughs> Despite the reputed success of heat, Augusta knew when this would not be successful. At times, when a difficult delivery was beyond her limitation, she summoned a doctor. She recounted such an incident. I was mining a, a young woman down the hill there. I didn't get the afterbirth. I said, doctor, I get everything, but I didn't get the birth. The birth is why I call you. That time, Dr. Tappan was there. That time, he looked at me and say, how, but how you learn this trade? You know this work. You have a license. Augusta, Augusta never had a license. She claimed to have practiced for many years without obtaining one, but never was sanctioned by the authorities. She would tidy the mother and dress the baby's umbilical cord with, by bandaging it with, with cotton wadding. All clothes and floor bag were used for bandages and diapers. A herbal decoction would be brewed for the mother to drink immediately after the delivery. It was intended to to purge the body. Ms. Cumberbatch said that the drink was made of sweet mint, garden balsam, pear leaf, bay leaf, and crab eye bush. The mother was not allowed to leave the house or engage in activity for nine days. Four weeks after, she was given a bath with a similar combination of herbs. Augusta claims never to have lost a mother or a baby in nearly six decades of midwifery. Only a set of twins, which Mrs. Cumberbatch delivered, still stillborn. She never received any formal training, but yet was able to practice to the satisfaction of her clients and with a compliment to her skill by Dr. Tappin. Miss Bess received some formal training. This is another midwife that I interviewed. And she worked under the supervision of the parochial medical officer and district nurses in Christchurch. She began her career as a bedside nurse for her parents and then was asked to assist at Searle's Plantation House to nurse the elderly mother of the mistress there. Because of her experience in bed nursing, she was soon sought after to attend midwifery cases. 
The district nurse encouraged her to learn the nursing, and she went to Dr. Ward, the medical officer, for a recommendation. He encouraged her and gave her the name of a midwifery book to purchase. From this, he showed her the different ideas and pictures and advised her that if she read the book thoroughly, it would provide all the knowledge necessary. Ms. Bess states that in hundreds of deliveries she expected she encountered a few difficulties. The district nurse would monitor her activities. The medical officer was summoned when complications arose, such as breach presentations and hemorrhage. Most of her clients were laborers, some so poor that she had to provide the diapers made of old clothes and other necessities. Their beds were of grass, but many deliveries took place on the floor in a stooping position. Augusta also stated that most of her deliveries took place in this position. Most of her parents took a bush bath between nine and 10 days after delivery. To her, the bath was aromatic, quite aromatic, and the bather would clap it over her joints, shoulders, and back. The bushes she saw used were flora fence, pride of Barbados, sweet mint, sorosop leaves, guava leaves, hollyhock, bay leaves, clam cherry, and sometimes breadfruit leaves. So this was um, just a bit of the experience of the midwives. Um, but in 1947, the situation would change with the advent of a maternity hospital. This is a, a slide of the maternity hospital, which was located at Verona Bank Hall. The maternity hospital's antenatal clinic opened at Verona Bank Hall on the 15th of December, 1947, and the general wards to patients in 20, on the 26th of January, 1948. In his first three months of operations, 368 patients attended the clinic and 59 were admitted to the ward. 43 deliveries were performed. Problematic births, which required surgical intervention, were sent to the general hospital. Expectant mothers who planned to have their babies at the hospital or in their homes could attend the antenatal clinic, which was open twice a week. This clinic was of major importance since for the first time, there was a facility where proper medical monitoring of pregnant mothers could be carried out. The hospital itself was intended to be primarily a teaching facility and had limited space, but through the clinic, vital medical attention could be provided for the large numbers who needed it. If this small 20-bed facility had provided only lining cases, then it would not have had a significant impact on maternal and child health. So this was intended, um, one of the first attempts really to, to deal with maternal health through um, the first real antenatal clinic in the island and the first real attempt to bring about modern midwifery training. The medical tests given to women at the antenatal clinics allowed for early detection of health problems that could mean congenital debility for the baby or high-risk delivery for the mother. Monitoring and, monitoring and early detection at the antenatal clinic therefore had the potential to reduce maternal mortality and neonatal mortality. So um, the mothers were also were tested and, um, and monitored. The, um, by 1938, another favorable development took place pertaining to child health. It was the creation of a school medical and dental service. School children were examined by the sanitation officer and if necessary was referred to, uh, to a physician, the Barbados General Hospital or the eye clinic. Their treatment and glasses were provided free. The House Assembly debates on a bill for compulsory education. In this particular debate, um, I'm going to move now um, from looking just at health to the matter of infant feeding, of, of feeding, of feeding through the school system. 
the debate over the compulsory education in Barbados. In this debate, Grant Adams believed that compulsory education was not practicable since poor patients would be penalized since they could not afford to send their children to school. Though supporting the bill and urging other members to do so, he felt that many children were not benefiting from their education because of poor nutrition and felt that any legislation for compulsory education will only be a pious hope on the statute book until provision is made for medical inspection of school children and for giving them some middle diet. The mere maintenance diet of the masses, which was dominated by starchy foods with an absence of protein, con was contributed to by extreme poverty due to low wages and large family size. On the nutrition of school children, they reported that teachers had observed that listlessness and inattention in school were due to underfeeding. The low weekly wage paid parents on Saturdays did not allow them to provide their children with a proper meal after Wednesday each week. The teachers had noted an improvement in the health of pupils who had attended the daily feeding programs of voluntary organization five days a week for a few months. When B.S. Platt, Platt visited the West Indies conducting research for the Committee on Nutrition in the Colonial Empire, he, commented the Barbadian, he commended the Barbadian mid-morning stat as a method of improving the nutrition of school children in the Caribbean. Consisting of a pint of milk and two biscuits, the milk provided vitamin B2, in which the typical West Indian diet was deficient, as well as first-class protein and calcium. The biscuits provided a source of energy at a time when blood sugar levels were low, since breakfast was consumed three or four hours earlier. Due to logistical difficulty of distributing hot meals to the elementary school throughout the country, he felt that the biscuits and milk were a more practical solution. I think most of us of uh, the older generation would be familiar with the milk and biscuits, and now we know um, the, the history of that. Okay. Um, voluntary organizations were making a tremendous contribution at this time. The most notable efforts came from the Barbados Social Women's Welfare League, who established a baby league. This, from this clinic, foodstuffs such as dried milk, barley, and vitamins were distributed, and medical treatment given by doctors who provided their services free. This type of assistance was necessary because, and I, I quote, of the extreme poverty of mothers almost all unmarried. When you read the, the, the sources for this time, we see that there was a real bias against um, children who were, born, who were born out of wedlock, and it was always mentioned as a reason to, to blame the poor on their, the suffering of their own children. So you had the, um, the Baby League, who did a tremendous amount of work, and you had um, voluntary Another voluntary effort through the work of John Beckles and Madame Eiffel, Madame Elise Eiffel. John Beckles was an entrepreneur who, had influenced, who was influenced by the ideas of Marcus Garvey and Booker T. Washington. His success in business provided him with the, with the property qualifications to be a political candidate. He was elected to the St. Michael Vestry in 1921 and that of Christ Church in 1930. He held posts such as church warden, poor law guardian, and was committed to the improvement of his people through health, housing, education, and nutrition. Beckles held a, a public meeting where he spoke about the community's pervasive poverty. Out of this came the formation of the Children's Goodwill League. Beckles was his chairman and Mrs. Olga Simmons as president. In May 1935, they opened a crash for working mothers in Reed Street, which was under the supervision of Eunice Seal, a retired nurse. Another objective of the League was to provide a daily meal for school children. In 1936, it started a breakfast center in Queen's Park, catering to 60 children. Soon, it was providing meals for the children of 13 schools in Bridgetown, St. Michael. The League was assisted in this work by the Education Department and Business Houses. 
Another major achievement was the opening of an antenatal clinic through the efforts of Dr. Winston Scott, a former first governor, native born governor general, who be, um, mothers were given lectures in infant care and were assisted by a nurse. Much of the financial support for the Goodwill League came from Beckles' own finances. The Governor and Executive Committee granted the use of the old railway building and workshop for the creche. However, most of the League's activities were possible through voluntary assistance, and after John Beckles retired from politics in 1943, there seems to have been a financial struggle to remain open. Despite the efforts of the friendly committee of the Children's Goodwill League, John Beckles was forced to close the creche. And um, one of our government day nurseries is named after him, and rightly so. Um, also, Madame Eiffel, she made a tremendous contribution, being a woman of some means, owning and running a successful bus company. Influenced by John Beckel's work with the Children's Goodwill League, she believed that there was a need for a similar kind of organization in the parish of Christ Church. After convening a meeting on this idea, a committee was formed and it was decided to launch a program for feeding the school children in five Christ Church schools. Utilizing her home for the project, utilizing her home for the project, two other schools were added when an inspector alerted her of the hunger of children there. This feeding provided much relief until an island-wide system of providing school children with milk and biscuits was introduced. The Christchurch Baby Welfare League also provided a clinic for infants. In 1948, there was a total of 2,510 attendances. Relief to needy mothers and children was also a substantial part of their activities in that same year. 16, in that same year, 16,667 pounds of powdered milk were, was distributed. Nutritional supplements in the form of cod liver oil, malt liver oil, and infant oil were also distributed. Madam Eiffel also provided the first day nursery in Christchurch, motivated by what was, in her words, a frightful tragedy. And she gave this account. A mother who attended the league for milk for her baby took the baby with her to work and left it safely under a vine. But later, a mortal lorry passed by over the same vine and injured the child who died from the injuries received. This caused Madame Eiffel to branch out into um, the opening of day nurseries rather than just clinics. Um, so there was a clinic in Darrell's Road and another in Danbury um, Court and then there was another one in the parish of St. John. Okay. In the late 1940s and 1950s is where we have, we see a transformation in the public health situation in Barbados. The, after the Second World War, the, the British government um, showed greater interest in, um, in fostering and funding improvement in public health and welfare in the colonies. And all of this, of course, came out of the Moyne Commission that followed the, the riots in the 1930s. So um, we see finally then um, a, a structure, a public health system put in place. Now, health centers were um, key to this new system. The Moyne Commission had recommended the establishment of health centers from which health visitors could work in the community, provide medical attention and education for mothers, as well as monitor the development of their infants. The idea for these centers was also adopted as part of the reform program put forward by the Barbados Progressive League. Its 1940 statement of policy stated, the League is of the opinion that there should be added provision for clinics to deal with antenatal cases, child welfare, tuberculosis, cancer, and social diseases. In the proposal put forward for the reorganization of the medical services in Barbados, the Chief Medical Officer recommended that government set up health centers in the reorganization of parish constituencies 
and the, jur the jurisdiction of the medical officer for that area to be supervised by the director of medical services. After some delay due to tardiness in renovating the acquired premises, the first health center opened in, at Spike Sound, St. Peter in 1953. It was to serve the north of the island, which included the parishes of St. James, St. Lucy, St. Andrew, and St. Joseph, St. Thomas, as well as St. Peter. Dr. Morris Bile was the medical officer in charge, and, and the care at the center was under the direction of senior public health nurse, Aurora Walters. The major activities of the center were antenatal and postnatal clinics, health education, and venereal disease treatment and tracing. By 1955, Nurse Walters was assisted by four junior public health nurses. They carried out an extensive educational campaign in the communities and villages, often at night. Methods of instruction were group teaching and discussion and the use of film, posters, and leaflets. There were also study groups for school teachers where information provided by the British Council on Health um, was used. The nurses also had the task of educating parents on the value of immunization. There was still a great deal of ignorance and distrust since many parents still believed that immunization could make children ill or even cause death. This was compounded by the fact that, that existing legislation did not make it compulsory. The nurses were able to inform and reassure mothers on the benefits and indeed necessity for immunization and were able to see increased numbers of children being brought to the health centers for immunization. In addition, to le in addition the legislation was amended, making it compulsory for all children to be in immunized against diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough, poliomyelitis, and measles before entering school. The clinic was able to monitor the progress of, these, of pregnancies and were therefore able to detect abnormalities which would pose danger at the time of delivery. In commenting on the maternal and child health work of the center, Dr. Morris Bias said that their strategy for reducing the prenatal causes contributed to neonatal mortality consisted of health education for mothers in the antenatal period, encouraging better nutrition in mothers, especially in the consumption of proteins, early detection of toxemias, and treatment of syphilis. Gastrointestinal diseases contributed largely to post-neonatal mortality and were tackled by the center through better sanitation and better feeding, feeding information. The health center was also a base from which to carry out environmental health reform. Precast latrines were constructed and sold to the public at a low cost. An educational program had also been undertaken to demonstrate installation and benefits of these systems. The work of the health centers did much in improving the health standards in the communities which they served and were probably the greatest catalyst in decreasing infant mortality and morbidity. The medical officer for Six Roads Health Center, Dr. Kenneth Standard, noted that infant mortality in the southern part of the island had been higher than the rest of Barbados, but within two years of its opening, it was lower. He attributed this reduction to the health education and immunization programs of the health center. Family planning services were also provided, um, particularly after the creation of the Barbados Family Planning Association in 1955. The reduction in the birth rate from 33.7 per thousand in 1955 to 20.9 in 1969 can to a large extent be attributed to the adoption of birth control techniques. Between 1955 and 1960, a breakthrough had been made in reducing the infant mortality rate. For the first time in Barbados, it fell below 100 per thousand in 1956. Deaths from all causes had been reduced by about 50%. The causes of death with the most significant decrease were digestive, 57%, 
respiratory, 60.4%, and nutritional, 70.2%. There was no significant decrease in the other category, which included such diseases as congenital malformations, birth injuries, tetanus, syphilis, epidemic, and communicable diseases, although a slight decrease in the last four categories was noted. In analyzing child mortality in Barbados, Dr. Kenneth's standards suggested that the decrease from the 28 days to one year age range post neonatal period was the greatest achievement. He attributed this to the fact that it was less easy to reduce neonatal mortality, but felt it was still possible for reduce, to reduce those deaths by 25% with improved medical techniques. Conditions such as asphyxia, birth trauma, cord hemorrhage, cord infection, tetanus, neonatum, and syphilis, which contributed to, to the neonatal deaths, were all preventable. Maturity, which was also which was the largest single cause in this category, was found to be higher in women who had received little antenatal medical care and whose nutritional status was low. These two factors could also be reversed. The greatest success, therefore, had been achieved in reducing deaths in the post-neonatal period. The number of deaths in childhood, in children from one year to four years old was quite low and was more in line with statistics for a more developed country. Standard attributed this to four major factors. Education on child care being disseminated in the communities through health clinics, government and voluntary agencies, improvement in sanitation and environmental conditions, better hospital treatment and access to medical care, the coordinated efforts of doctors and nurses, professionally and on a volunteer basis, improved social and economic conditions in the community and a rising standard of living. Medical intervention and the implementation of public health measures contributed most to Barbados' success in reducing the the IMR within what was a relatively short time frame. Barbados was still going through a period of political transformation where the government, elected by universal adult suffrage for the first time in 1951, along with the work of the Barbados Workers' Union, sought to alleviate the conditions of the laboring classes. The economy was stabilized by the Commonwealth Sugar Agreement in 1952, when Britain committed itself to buying sugar at an agreed price which ensured the crop's profitability to the island. The provision of more generous welfare to the needy, the increased opportunities for education and employment, better housing conditions through the introduction of better sanitary systems, slum clearance and housing projects, and greater access to clean water contributed to a better standard of living. The public health activities in the communities and health centers had a more direct impact on child health. The more widely societal improvements may have had a positive impact on the health of the community as a whole. So um, in looking at this table then, you can see a dramatic, very dramatic decline in the, um, the infant mortality rate in Barbados. It starts at, at about 175 in 1947, and by 1960, um, it is at about um, 55. That's a tremendous, tremendous discrete, the, um, decrease. But that peak in 1955 was due to Hurricane Janet but from 1947, particularly in the last five years, between 55 and 1960, there is a very, very dramatic decrease in um, infant mortality in Barbados. And this was certainly a public health triumph. However one may care to interpret the process by which the health sector in Barbados was reformed, the fact remains that the most striking proof of success of the measures implemented was a dramatic decline in infant mortality rate between 1955 and 1960. For this achievement, Barbados was awarded the Kettering Shield by the National Baby Welfare Council of the United Kingdom in 1960. This body had organized a competition between the overseas territories of the British Commonwealth to determine which countries had, during the previous five years, 
made the greatest advance in individual, family, and community welfare. Barbados was awarded for its success in the maternal and child welfare services. Thank you.